the goal of discipleship is not information only, but the goal is to become like Jesus. Welcome to Face Chicago. I'm Debbie Frazier. Are you a disciple? Are you making disciples? Jesus told his followers to go and make disciples. He also had strong words for those who were following him during his public ministry, saying they must take up their cross daily. Today on Face Chicago, we're talking about the topic of discipleship. Dwayne Eslick is the pastor of New Life Community Church in Rogers Park, and Pastor Paco Amador leads New Life Community Church in Little Village. So glad you're both with us today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's so great to be with you. So what is discipleship? One of my favorite verses about being a disciple is in Luke 640. And Jesus said, a student is not above his teacher, but every student when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. And that's Luke 640. The ESV uses the term disciple. A disciple is not above his teacher, but every disciple when fully trained will be like his teacher. And so the goal of discipleship is not information only. We definitely need to learn about Jesus, but the goal is to become like Jesus so that we're being conformed to his image, being more and more like him in our everyday lifestyle. And so discipleship is the process of helping someone become more and more like Jesus in knowledge, knowing who He is, and also in our heart being transformed, but also our hands where we're serving and on mission with Jesus. Um, Jesus always told people, um, follow me, <laughs> which means just watch me as I go. Watch me as I do. Follow me really doesn't mean as much to me. Um, just, you know, I just drop everything and go. It means I imitate his actions, his motion, his way of thinking, his relationship with the Father. And it's actually uh, something that we've been told through Scripture to do, Matthew 28, 19, Jesus is saying, go therefore and make, make disciples. disciples. So it is something that we are expected to do in our walk with Christ. And it is not just something that we're expected to do. We're naturally people who follow others. You know, it's just, I, I remember sitting down with a friend and he told me, I'm so proud that my son loves Pittsburgh Steelers, just like I do. You know? And it's just a son who has seen the love that the father has for the Steelers, you know, is misplaced, uh, you know, love. But uh, <laughs> at the same time, it's just... I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, it's just the son looks and says, I, I, I love what my daddy loves. I love my yeah, daddy. just want to be more point. like... Right, and right. it feels like discipleship is not a weird thing coming out of no, the left field. No, because we are a disciple. It's what humans anyway, do. Right. Humans tend to follow the example of those whom, whom they love. And um, uh, it's interesting, uh, probably the single greatest uh, moment of discipleship is parenting. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so God told the people of Israel, wherever you go, whatever you do, be talking about me. Talk about my words. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's just, you know, just constantly pass mm. who I am and your love for me to the generations that are watching you. And that's making disciples. Making disciples is just setting the standard and inviting others to follow. How did Paul disciple Timothy? I think that's a great, because sometimes the last actually chapter in the Bible that mentions disciple, the word disciple is Acts 21. And so from Acts 21 all the way to the end of Revelation, we don't see the actual word disciple, but we see the same principles. And so what did Paul say to Timothy? He calls him my son in the faith. Mm -hmm. And so really discipling is spiritual parenting. Yeah. He poured into Timothy and he, their relationship became so close. He's like, this is my son. This is somebody I love. And, and in America, we're kind of a little uncomfortable with saying, oh, this is my spiritual dad mm -hmm. or my spiritual mom. Somebody that's really poured into me and helped shape my life spiritually. And that's really what disciple making is, is parenting people spiritually. What are some of the misconceptions? Oh, some of, I, I feel like um, one of the misconceptions is that, you know, I wasn't discipled, so I cannot make disciples. Ah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like that's probably the single greatest one. You know, I think people expect that they had to have like a year or two of intense pouring into by, the, by another person, which of course would be awesome if somebody right. had, you know, but most of us have not. Most of us will not. Well, and I'm still in the process of making mistakes. Do I really want someone watching me? But that's another, yeah. 
I asked a small group even at our own church, is this great commission for all believers or just is this like a team sport where like the pastor does disciple or the special people? And I was surprised how many would say, oh, I could never make a disciple or it doesn't apply to me personally. You kind of think that, but we can talk about how, when we come back from the break, how maybe we can be a good disciple for someone else. So how do we become good disciples and how can we find someone disciple us? We'll talk about that when we come back. Welcome back to Faith Chicago. From the message translation in Luke, Jesus said, simply put, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciple. Pastor Dwayne Eslick from New Life Community Church Rogers Park and Pastor Paco Amador from New Life Little Village are discussing this topic of discipleship with me today. Before we continue, let's hear what Pastor Tony Evans had to say during Moody Founders Week about the nature of true discipleship and its power to change society. There must be the declaration that I come under his rule. I am identified with him and I exercise kingdom authority because I'm not just merely a Christian. I'm a fully attached disciple of Jesus Christ who brings all of his life under divine rule. And until that's done, authority is withheld. So you wind up with church. Now, nothing wrong with church. I believe in church. Church is critical, but that's all you wind up with. Because when you go back out into the worker day world, when you get back out into politics and sociology and education and whatever your sphere of responsibility is, you find out there's no authority here. Why is there no authority out there when there's all these Christians in here? I mean, wait a minute. You and I will never travel again like we traveled before 9-11. 9-11 has forever changed our trajectory of travel. I mean, security is everywhere, cameras are everywhere. You will never have that free flow that you had before 9-11. That is because 19 men came to our country in the name of their faith and shut America down. Now, help me. How can 19 men from halfway around the world in the name of their faith shut the most powerful country in the world down? I will tell you how. Because they were disciples of their belief system. They were fully committed, fully engaged, representatives of their belief system. Now, if 19 men can shut down the most powerful nation in the world in the name of a faulty belief system, how much more do you think believers in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ can enter the culture and impact it for the glory of God piggybacking off of divine authority? Help me. How can we have all these churches on all these corners with all these Christians and all these programs and all these ministers and all these ministries and all this activity and all these facilities and still have all this mess? There's a dead monkey on the line somewhere. Comments of what you just heard? Oh, what a powerful illustration. Yes. Right to the heart. I mean, the biggest question about whether we ourselves are disciples is Jesus fully Lord of our lives and coming under his authority and submitting to him. And that's really the big question. We want to have, you know, eternal life insurance, so to speak, to avoid the fires of hell. But on this side of eternity, do we want to be fully devoted followers of Christ? Yeah, do we want to be yeah. where he's our head, he's our Lord, he's our master, and we're his servants and we're followers of him? And um, that's the real, that's a lot of times we become, we're in a stage of counting the cost and we haven't come to that point of saying, yes, Jesus, you're Lord of all my life, not just part of my life. Hey, um, uh, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, a second letter, and he tells him, hey, um, do not be ashamed of God hmm. or of me, who are, you know, I'm a prisoner because of my, you know, because of the gospel. And he tells him, but you should also join us in suffering. And I feel like that little join us in suffering, like the welcoming of, um, you know, yeah. in anything that you follow, you will suffer. The question is if it's worth it or not, you know. Um, you will suffer pain 
a lot of money to go and watch the Cubs. You know, it's like, in other words, any that's and you will, that's rewarding. You will suffer a <laughs> hundred years of losing games. What used to be what, suffering. Used what to be not suffering. to get involved in. <laughs> but at the very same time, it's like anything you decide to uh, to follow, you will have to yes, suffer. You will true. have to die to some things to follow on others. But um, I think since the very beginning, we've realized that. Um, following Jesus will mean that we will suffer in yeah. many great things. And the thing is that we can't have it both ways. We can't be a fully devoted follower of Jesus, which is just a disciple uh, of Jesus, and at the same time not suffer, not die, not be rejected, you know, not have to love enemies and bless those who persecute you. And mentoring, do you consider discipleship and mentoring the same? I call the discipling, we at our church, we call it mentoring. And uh, it's a more of a modern term because discipleship isn't a uh, you know, term we use in our everyday life anymore. And, but I think there's an element of apprenticeship because there's an element of training, like Jesus was training the 12. And I think also sometimes um, there's, a, there's a, almost a sense of a openness. When I've been discipled or mentored by yeah, others, it's saying... Talk about that for a minute. I mean, when I was a teenager, I was one of the worst kids in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I accepted Jesus at 13. I had already been arrested twice. No. And, um, but what was amazing was a guy named Mr. Hansen, Mr. Jerry Hansen. He not only was my teacher on Wednesday, but every Tuesday he had me, my mother, and my brother over for dinner. And it was the first time I ate dinner around the table with a family. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we would eat dinner. My mom would stay with his wife, and then he would take me and my brother to the back porch, and he would, we would just ask him any questions that we wanted, and he would just, and it could be non-religious, spiritual, any questions mm -hmm. about life, and he just really poured into us and loved us. Mm -hmm. And then on Wednesday, when we were memorizing Bible verses and doing Bible studies, he was my hero. He was my example. He was somebody that really loved us. And, and I've actually had like different people, almost like the, I use the Mississippi River. Mm. You know, there's, you go down in, in Louisiana and it's this powerful big river with giant ships. And, but I've been also in Minnesota where it's this small little river and there's like an Ohio River pouring into it. There's mm. all these different streams coming in. So that becomes this powerful river and there's been people that taught me like like Mr. Gass about character and Pastor Paul who taught me how to share my faith and took me on mission trips and had me over to sleep at his house and his, his kids his younger daughters would call me their big brother and you know so it's like it's a lot of meant people something family. To you. It wasn't a bother this was actually this built your character in your life you depended on this any of those pieces missing would have been a, a hole. A big part of just a chunk taken away yes. from who I am today. And so, so that's a wonderful argument from being a disciple. Yeah, yeah. There's a verse in First Thessalonians where Paul says, "Not only did we share the gospel with you, but we shared our life." Our lives. And uh, they, they, you can't disciple without life on life and sharing your life. Should we take seriously the idea of making disciples ourselves? Well, we'll talk about that and more after the break. Don't go away. Today we're exploring the topic of discipleship on Faith Chicago. The Four Absolutes were written over 100 years ago. They're a set of guidelines for life, some say based on the principles of Jesus. They are absolute honesty, absolute purity, absolute unselfishness, and absolute love. We asked church leaders to weigh in on these four values. What would happen if the church was unselfish, loving? pure and honest. If the church practiced those four absolutes, I believe that the church would look quite different than it looks today. That church would, I mean, that would be like heaven on earth. I think it would look a lot like Jesus. Christians would really be known as distinctive uh, and, you know, that, in that King James language, peculiar people. It would not be a place of individuals who are probably like you or me, there would probably be a place of individuals that are totally different from us. It would make us so vulnerable until nothing would stand in between us and God. And the world would see Christ for who he is and not for who we want him to be. If it is people who are committed to purity and to love, then what's going on is 
as you're dealing with these people in their various stages of transformation, it's a community of great generosity and care and love. A church that is filled with love, a church that is unselfish, a church that is filled with honesty, says, I'm laying aside my agenda to get back to the heartbeat of God. That's almost impossible. It is impossible without transformation. And so I think what's, what's really lacking in our churches today is faith. You know, we think of it as a truth problem. I don't think it's really a truth problem. I think it's a faith problem. I believe once all men come into the unity of the faith and unto the knowledge of the Son of God, unto the measure and the stature and the fullness of Christ, that we'll be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. We would only have those four, and that four would be beautiful because we have believed on the person of Christ. And so I think we really do need to get back to being like Jesus, and it really would be following those four absolutes. Your thoughts? Uh, we're called to die to ourselves. Hmm. Uh, I feel like uh, just even the language of dying to ourselves, you know, we come into this newness of life through the ritual of baptism. We're saying, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Uh, like, I fully agree. Wow, that's, it's, but it's an invitation of being, um, of coming away, coming out. And, uh, you know, following Jesus, it really means uh, I come just as I am. And in the company and the community of faith, people love me for who I am, but at the same time, uh, their presence and God's love starts, you know, sharpening away the many things that, you know, and all of life, it will take all of life. Man. Sometimes I quit. <laughs> it will take all of life. <laughs> well, I think part of the challenge with it is in uh, we lower the expectation. First John 2, 6 says that uh, this is how we know what love is, that Christ laid down his life for us. And then it says anyone who claims to abide in Jesus, the Messiah, ought to walk as he walked. And so he's saying, just like how he loved us and was willing to lay down his life for us, we should love our brothers and sisters in Christ so much that we're willing to lay down our life for them. And that that's the result of us abiding in him. If he's abiding in us and we're abiding in him and the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, this is actually possible that we could grow into a mature love where I'm not thinking about myself, I'm walking in purity. And, uh, but, but the so against society. And yeah. even so against what's going on in the really world. It's really not seen too much in the church. It's easy to go to church and sit side by side, look at the back of somebody's head, but to say, hey, we're living life together and we really love each other. I, love I know what's going on in your life and, and I, I really you. care. <laughs> yeah, he, he has to forgive, forgive me a you. lot. <laughs> <laughs> forgive me. I forgave you. Don't worry about a it. A long time ago, or, or even right now. <laughs> and you know, when you stop to think about it, as Christians, in some ways, we are a disciple without actually realizing it. Mm. You know, at the workplace mm. and with the extension of the oh, days, yeah. eight, ten hour work days or more, you know, you're with other people all the time. You may be the only Christ they see that yeah. day. Yeah. And w since Christ is in us and goes wherever we go, we are taking light into that workplace. So we are disciples without perhaps realizing it. So how do we look oh, that yeah. day at work? That's kind of sometimes the misnomer, or like the terminology. Like sometimes we think, like actually it was in the mid 1800s where someone wrote first evangelism and discipleship. Mm. Where really disciple making includes the going where you're reaching someone and then you reach them, you got to baptize them. And then once they've been baptized and they say, I'm a follower of Christ, you have to teach them how do you live this out? And so making disciples includes the evangelistic part and it includes the edification part so that people are exalting God. So it's like both evangelism and edification are part of discipleship. So how do we disciple our own families, our own children? That scares me to death every time I study discipleship more and more because I realize without even trying, my kids are becoming like me. They're imitating me. They have my same faults and I... I'm like, Lord, help me be more like you because I do not want to lead them astray. Help me be more and more like you myself so that as they imitate me, they're more and more like you. I feel like the most, uh, it's, it's hugely important for us to just be lovers of God. Just mm -hmm. love God and let him mold us. Um, be obedient to what Christ tells us and um, love love the family, you know, love our children, spend time mm -hmm. with them. Just Deuteronomy 6 is such a powerful verse. How would the, the Jewish faith against all odds continue throughout the centuries? Well, parents just 
talked with their kids through every issue of life by saying God is in our midst. God has chosen us. God is. Well, I have some more questions for you after the break. We'll conclude our discussion on discipleship, so stay with us. Today we've been uncovering some of the layers to discipleship, both in becoming disciples and in making disciples. My guests are Pastors Dwayne Eslick and Paco Amador, both lead New Life Churches. So my question for you now is, the goal of discipleship, is it to become leaders or servants? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Well, the best leaders are servants, and Jesus was a servant leader. But I do think um, if you take leadership as influence, we definitely have to start with the end product in mind. So whenever I'm pouring in discipling someone, I see them as a future disciple maker, that they're going to make disciples who are going to make disciples who are going to make disciples. So if I have to pour into them to the best of my ability and, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, because they're going to have an influence on generations to come. Hey, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me, he says, um, because they know that I will give my life for them. And I feel like service of dying on behalf of others. Um, you know, there's two ways of trying to force people to do things. One of them is to be a sergeant, you know, like telling people, hey, no, you've got to do this. You've... And another is to, uh, to lead by example and to die on behalf of people. And the sheep know that guy will give everything for me. I'll follow that guy. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, Jesus you. had 12 disciples and a public ministry that lasted only three years, and yet, that's all it took to change the world. Jesus' disciples were a flawed group to be sure, but once Jesus was raised from the dead, this small group showed us what it truly means to be a disciple. They gave up everything, even their lives to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you wanna know more about this gospel, or if you'd like to comment on today's program, email us or visit our Face Chicago Facebook page. And please consider partnering with TLN. This program and ministry are both donor-supported. We'll see you next time on Face Chicago.